Hello everyone and welcome to CRAMSurge, clinical research appraisal and methodology for surgical trainees, where we pick a paper fresh from the press on a hot general surgical topic. We review it for you, we present it for you, we critique its methodology for you and provide top of the field expert opinions and teaching on research appraisal and methodology. My name is Gio Perrin and together with Professor Sababella Subramanian, Adam Haig, Ben Wood and Josh Lau, we bring you Crown Surge from the wonderful region of the Yorkshire and the Humber. So we talked about uh, some measures of risk in the last tutorial and we focused on uh, odds ratios and relative risk. So we will revisit those concepts very briefly and then move on to some other measures of risk uh, for, the rest of the, for the rest of the tutorial. Right. So, uh, so what's uh, what's uh, odds ratio? So as we heard from Josh and uh, Gio, odds ratio is simply the ratio of two odds, and the two odds are the odds of the event happening in one group to that in the other group. Okay, so uh, it is a measure of risk, and we've uh, heard before that it is uh, it can be an exaggerated estimate of your true risk, um, but it is something that you can calculate only in a case control study where you don't know the incidences um, of the event happening in the exposed and the non-exposed group, as opposed to the relative risk, which is the ratio of two probabilities. So for odds ratio, we say it's ratio of two odds, and for relative risk, we say it's ratio of two probabilities. And the two probabilities are the probability of the event happening in one group to that of the other group. Okay, so I hope um, this concept is a bit more familiar now, and if it isn't, then um, by all means, uh, check out the, uh, the first part of the measures of risk tutorial uh, that's on the internet. So we're going to talk about uh, some other measures, and these include the relative risk reduction, oops, the absolute risk reduction, the number needed to treat, and the attributable risk. And uh, the first three measures are quite related to each other. So I'll try and explain all of these with an example. And then uh, I have a couple of slides on attributable risk. So this can be a little bit complicated, especially if this is the first time that you're hearing about these measures. But uh, by all means, you know, look back at this uh, tutorial at the PowerPoint later in your own time. And I'm sure if you've uh, looked at it two or three times, it will all become uh, really clear. So I've only got eight to nine slides more, and we'll take it one step at a time, um, slowly, and uh, hopefully that'll be easy to then uh, digest the information that I'm presenting. Okay, so here's an example. So we've got a 70-year-old female who presented with a breast lump that turned out to be cancer on biopsy, and then had surgery. So you've got some information about the histology. It is a 45 millimeter size tumor, ER negative, uh, HER2 positive, and she had positive lymph nodes. So this is all the information that I have. Bear in mind that I'm not a breast surgeon, so uh, don't ask me any more questions about um, uh, uh, the details of the case. But based on this example, if you wanted to know, or the patient wishes to know, what a survival is likely to be, You've got a lot of um, very useful online calculators that make use of um, this kind of information and give you an estimate of survival. And they can provide estimates on a number of outcomes, uh, but let's just focus on survival. Now, these online calculators make use of the tons and tons of data that has been produced over the last few decades. And, uh, and they um, use the data to be able to uh, give you information on uh, um, potential um, outcomes in terms of survival and recurrence and so on and so forth. So one such online calculator is um, the PREDICT tool. The website for the tool is uh, there on the screen for you. This is um, part of the NHS website, so um, you can put in um, information on any patient on this website on this calculator and it'll give you some uh, data on outcomes. So this is the data I got for this patient. So you see um, the 
uh, table on the top right. So the overall survival uh, is presented um, for the surgery only um, group, or if this patient had just had surgery, then they predict that the overall survival will be 22%. If this patient had chemotherapy as well, uh, we're not going to the specifics of what chemotherapy, but if this patient had chemotherapy as well, then the survival will go up to 30%. This is overall five-year survival. The website also gives you data for 10-year survival. So for this patient with um, just surgery, the overall 10-year survival would be 11%. If the patient also had chemotherapy, the survival would go up to 17%. So this is a 10-year survival. Now, let's just focus on the five-year survival data and let's look at it again. So with surgery, the likelihood of this patient living for five years is 22%. And if you add chemotherapy, it goes up to 30%. So keep these numbers in mind because now I'm going to ask you um, some questions. Right. What I want you to do is to look at the statements that will appear on your screen. And uh, either you can take a pen and paper and try and work things out, or you make a mental note of these statements and uh, figure out for me which of these statements are true. So uh, the, the first statement is chemotherapy will increase your chances of survival over five years by 8%. So the question is, is this true or is this false based on what I had said to you just a minute ago? We, we can go back and look at that slide again. So with surgery, the overall survival is 22%. With chemotherapy, it goes up to 30%. Okay, so that's the first statement. The second statement is this. The chances of living up to five years will go up by 36% if you have chemotherapy. Is that true or false? The next statement is if you have chemotherapy, you're 10% less likely to die in the next five years. Is this true or false? And the last statement is chemotherapy would be needed to be given to 12 such patients for one patient to see a benefit in five year survival. So um, if you're watching this as a video um, later on, you can pause the video and think about it and then come back and resume. So I'm gonna give you um, maybe half a minute and then we can have a discussion. If you did want me to go back to the previous slide, let me know. We can, we can have a quick chat now if, uh, if anyone wants to unmute and uh, uh, talk to me and tell me what you think. So my, I got true, false, false, true. True, false, false, true. Okay. Any other um, uh, answers? No, no one else wants to hazard a guess. Gio? Um, no, I'm still behind with the calculations. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, you, I'll, I'll back up Josh, whatever he said. Okay, uh, <laughs> anybody else beg to differ? No? Okay, fine. So, here are the answers, and I think you'll be a little bit surprised. The first is true, second is true, third is true, fourth is true. Oh. All four are true. Okay, so we'll explain why, and hopefully then you will understand what the various um, uh, other measures of risk um, that we mentioned at the beginning of the presentation actually mean. So the first one is pretty straightforward, I think. So that's what is called absolute risk reduction. So uh, absolute risk reduction is simply the difference in risk in the two groups. EER refer refers to an experimental group event rate, which is chemotherapy event rate, and CER refers to control event rate, which is the surgery only arm, yeah? So that's kind of the definition for absolute risk reduction. So we've said before that in one group, the risk is 22%, the other group, um, the risk, when I say risk, I mean the event, and the event here is surviving. So uh, really, it's not a risk in the true sense of the word, but um, for the definitions of these 
parameters, we call them risk. So the uh, chances of surviving in the two groups are 22 and 30 percent, and the difference is 8 percent. So that's the absolute risk reduction. OK, so that's hopefully straightforward. The second is what we call relative risk reduction or relative risk benefit, if you like, of surviving or living. So essentially, that's the difference in rates between the two groups divided by the control event rate or divided by the rate of surviving in the control group or the non-chemo group. So that is 30 take away 22 divided by 22. So that would be 36. So it's a relative risk of living up to five years if you had chemotherapy is 36%. Okay, the next um, statement is also true because it is looking at relative risk the other way around. It's not looking at relative risk of living, it's looking at relative risk of dying because we've said less likely to die. So essentially, you're looking at the um, risk of dying, which is 78, take away 70% in the two groups, yeah, divided by the control um, event rate or the risk of dying in the non-chemotherapy group. So that is 78 minus 70 um, divided by 78, which is roughly 10%. Okay. So in the last one is uh, what we call NNT or number needed to treat. The number needed to treat simply refers to the number of patients that need to have a particular intervention or exposure for one additional event to happen. So it simply is the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So if you've got the absolute risk difference uh, or reduction of 8%, you just say 1 divided by 8%, which is 1 divided by 0 0.08, which is 12.5. So the reason the number needed to treat um, is important is that it gives some idea to healthcare providers and funders as to how um, useful a particular treatment will be to society because it tells them here that you need to give chemotherapy to 12 patients for one person to see a benefit in and their five-year survival rates okay so these are all um, useful parameters of risk obviously they're all quite different and you can imagine how um, different clinicians might sit down with a patient and talk about risk using these different parameters, particularly absolute risk reductions and relative risk reductions. And when you talk about relative risk reductions, you're, uh, you're talking about the risk of living and going up, or are you talking about the risk of dying going down with the chemo? And, and as you can see, the numbers are all different. So we're not... Uh, lying here, we're not making anything up, but just looking at uh, the numbers in a different way can give you uh, different estimates of risk. And therefore, you see how um, confused patients can get um, if they are being presented with risks in many different ways. And you could also see how patients can be easily led astray, if you like, or even manipulated, if you like, if the treating clinician or the surgeon or the nurse specialist has a specific sort of bias or prejudice even towards one treatment or the other. Okay, so it's important for us to understand uh, what is the risk we're talking about and it's impo important for us to think about how we communicate that risk. Okay, now let's just uh, expand on this concept a bit more. Um, by using a further example, a sort of extreme example. So um, we're going to be talking about absolute risk reduction and relative risk reduction using an example. So again, looking at the definitions first, absolute risk reduction is simply the absolute difference in risk between treated and non-treated groups. In this scenario, chemotherapy versus only surgery groups. Now the relative risk, risk reduction is the difference in risk between the treated and non-treated groups relative to the non-treated group. So you've got to divide by the risk in the non-treated group. Okay, so let's look at this example, which is essentially um, looking at survival following breast cancer at 10 years. So 10 years survival in a very extreme sort of hypothetical cohort of patients who do rather poorly. So 
you've got one group of patients who've had surgery with chemotherapy, a hundred of them, and two have survived at 10 years, which is quite a low number. And another group of patients who had surgery alone, and again, out of 100 patients, uh, only one survived. So clearly the surgery with chemotherapy group have done better than the surgery alone group, but as you can see, the difference is not massive. So if you look at absolute risk reduction uh, or the benefit of chemotherapy, you can see that the difference in um, survival in the chemo versus the no chemo arm is just 1%, okay? And if you remember um, what we talked about absolute risk, we said that absolute risk in the chemo arm um, is um, the, the survival is 2%. The chance of surviving in the surgery alone arm is 1%. So the difference is 1%, right? If you have a look at relative risk reduction with chemo, like we said before with the definition, you look at the difference between the treated and the non-treated arms or the chemo, uh, surgery with chemo and the surgery alone arms relative to the um, chances of um, survival in the surgery alone arm. Essentially, you're saying you, you subtract these two, so it's two minus one, which is one, and relative to how many would have survived in the surgery alone arm, which is just one. So you've got a relative risk reduction of 100%. So this is an extreme example where the um, chances of survival is quite low and the chemo um, is making only a small dent in survival, one extra person surviving, but that's one um, on top of the one person that survived with surgery alone. So relatively, it's making a big impact, 100%, you know, two-fold Im improvement in survival. But the absolute benefit is just 1%, one person in a total of 100 people if you give chemotherapy. So in an extreme case, you can see how um, you can either tell the patient that it's only 1% will benefit, or you can tell the patient, well, actually, there's a two-fold improvement in survival with chemotherapy. Okay, so I hope that makes it a little bit clearer. And then we'll go on to this table, which looks at relative risk reduction, absolute risk reduction, and the so-called NNT, or the number needed to treat. Now, we go back to the same example that we talked about, uh, wherein the 70-year-old female with particular histological characteristics um, has had surgery, and then you're thinking of whether to give chemotherapy to her or not. So using the same predict um, calculator, we have calculated that at five years, death at five years in the no chemo arm is 78%. If you add chemotherapy, it goes down to 70%. So the absolute risk reduction in death is 8%. That's straightforward. With 78 take away 70 is 8%. Now, relative risk reduction would be at the absolute risk divided by the death rate at five years. So that would be 8 over 78. That would be 10%. Okay. And then NNT, or the number needed to treat, is simply the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So it's 1 by 8% or 1 by 0 0.08, that is 12.5 patients. So essentially, you're saying that you need to treat 12 and a half patients, around 12 patients, to reduce the risk of death um, at five years, um, to, do, or to save one life at five years. So that's what the top row means. Now, if you then want to look at death at 10 years, you do very similar calculations, and you find that the number needed to treat to prevent one death at 10 years is um, 17 patients. And the same um, parameter for 15 years is about 25 patients. Obviously, as time goes, more and more people are uh, going to succumb to either the disease or to other um, uh, pathologies and the number needed to treat is going to go up and up. And you could do similar uh, calculations for other outcomes as well, such as recurrence. Okay. Now, the thing you have to keep in mind is that this number needed to treat for a specific intervention really depends on the outcome you're measuring. So the number needed to treat for this chemotherapy 
would be dependent on what particular outcome you're talking about. If it is death, is it death from any cause or is it death from breast cancer? And if it's death, is it death at five years, two years, 10 years, 15 years? Or is it something uh, that is not to do with death? For example, recurrence of disease or maybe even quality of life. So you've got to keep in mind that the NNT or the number needed to treat for any intervention is entirely dependent on the outcomes. The outcomes need to be defined very clearly. And then you can compare uh, the effects of that particular intervention with the NNT from another intervention if you want to do so. The other thing to keep in mind is that the relative risk reduction is always higher than the absolute risk reduction. So as you can see from the table, as the absolute risk reduction goes down, the relative risk reduction also goes down, but it's always higher than the absolute risk. Okay, just like we um, talked in the last tutorial that um, odds ratios are an exaggeration of the relative risk. I'm, t I'm saying here that the relative risk reduction is an exaggerated estimate of the absolute risk reduction. Right, so we're moving on to a slightly different concept called attributable risk. Attributable risk is also known as risk difference. And essentially it's a difference in rates of an outcome and in the example we're discussing, the outcome was death, in the groups with and without the risk factor of the intervention. And the intervention we've been discussing was chemotherapy. So essentially, attributable risk is a difference in the rates of death in the two groups. Yeah, so it can be used to quantify impact of specific risk factors or interventions. In our example, it's a chemotherapy on an, any multifactorial disease or outcomes. Now, what does this mean? What does multifactorial disease or multifactorial outcomes mean? Now, a couple of hundred years ago, when people talked about diseases and causations, and they were focusing entirely on infectious diseases. For example, cholera or the plague or tuberculosis. And the prevailing concept at the time was that of single agent, single disease phenomenon. In other words, most infectious diseases were caused by a single specific agent. So if you had Vibrio cholerae, you get cholera. If you had Mycobacterium tuberculosis, you get TB. And the relationship is quite linear and simple. However, the majority of us that deal with diseases today deal with multifactorial diseases, such as lung cancer or breast cancer, where there's not just one uh, factor that causes the disease, but a variety of genetic and and environmental factors cause disease. And this is a significant interplay between the various genetic and environmental factors. So it's a lot more complicated. Same holds true for outcomes, such as wound infection, survival after cancer treatment, and recurrence after hernia repair. So it's not one specific risk factor, but a variety of risk factors. And if you want to know what the impact of each individual risk factor is, or what would be the improvement if you eliminate that risk factor, then you want to know what the attributable risk is or the risk that you can attribute to that one factor. Right, so how does attributable risk differs from relative risk? Let's um, talk about an, another example. So if you're looking at the relationship between say a risk factor and a specific cancer, let's say cancer X, you've got this typical two by two contingency table where you've got cancers in healthy um, cohorts arranged as columns, and you've got the, um, the risk factor presence or absence arranged as rows. And if you remember um, the how you calculate relative risk, we said that relative risk is simply the ratio of two probabilities, which is the probability of cancer in people with the risk factor, that is A by A plus B, divided by the probability of cancer in people without the risk factor, which is C by C plus D. Now, attributable risk or risk difference, however, is simply the difference between these two probabilities, not the ratio, which is relative risk, but the difference. So attributable risk is the probability of having cancer uh, if you have the risk factor, minus the probability of having cancer if you do not have the risk factor. And that's all it is. It's a, it's a difference between probabilities, 
well, relative risk is a ratio of probability. Right. And here's a picture, um, it's a schematic diagram of um, all potential risk factors that could cause cancer X, for example. So you've gotten here a partial Venn diagram that shows smoking, obesity, diet, and genetic factors that play a role in causing cancer X. You can also see that there are a number of, uh, there's a big space here, which is unfilled, which means that for many of these cancers, you know, we do, haven't identified all the risk factors, or we're putting it down to random occurrence or chance, and therefore um, the risk factors only account for a proportion of um, patients with cancer X. Okay, so if you then want to figure out, you know, how much each of these risk factors predispose to cancer X, you work out what we call the attributable risk. So you could say that the attributable risk for cancer X from smoking is about 10%. Genetic factors maybe play a role in another 10%, and so on and so forth. And this kind of information is useful for people who say, who uh, then say, okay, what can we do to reduce the risk of cancer X? Which are the modifiable factors? And which modifiable factors would you then try and target? And in this particular example, it would pay you a lot more to target smoking as opposed to, for example, targeting diet. And this obviously would be different for different cancers. Okay, so I hope that explains attributable risk a bit more. So we talked about relative risk, absolute risk, attributable risk, and the number needed to treat. You've got to keep in mind that all of these require the incident, incident rates. In other words, the denominator should be all the individuals exposed to the risk factor or intervention. In other words, as we've discussed before, you need a cohort type study to be able to calculate these measures of risk. So these cannot therefore be calculated using data from a case control study. And that's absolutely critical to remember, um, especially when you're setting out to do a study or when you're critiquing um, a paper. As opposed to odds ratios, which can only be calculated from a case control study uh, and then should not be calculated from a cohort study. Okay, right, so we've come to the end of this tutorial. So we've talked about uh, the numerous ways there are in, of expressing risk. We've talked about relative risk reductions, absolute risk reduction, and attributable risk. We've talked about the number needed to treat. And remember, that the number needed to treat is simply the reciprocal of the absolute risk reduction. So we talked about uh, relative values being important, especially when comparing different interventions. So uh, uh, they're certainly better than the odds ratio, and they give you a, a true estimate of risk that you can communicate with each. However, you've got to remember that these are only relative values. And you've got to remember that it's usually best to rely on absolute values when making decisions and in the care of an individual patient. Thank you very much. Thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. Until next time, keep running your life with our surgical podcast. <laughs>